blesses my heart to hear people share their heart. It really does. Because, you know, I, I, th I think about it a lot, and I think about all the blessings that, and everything that God has done for me. And then, uh, you know, to hear y'all share your, your testimonies, too, it does something to me. It really does. It really does. What a blessing. Because that's the problem with a lot of people these days. They're not thankful for what they have. And they're always looking for the next, well, how can I get this and how can I get that? I'm glad my life isn't made up like that. I mean, you know, in the, in the B.C. days, I always looked for what I could get into next or what I thought I wanted and that thing I would pursue. But that wasn't what it was all about. And then when the Lord saved me, He opened my eyes to that. Um, Steve Stewart, who was one of my professors at Fruitland, he puts out a blog every, uh, about one a week, every, one every couple of weeks. And he talked about having, uh, when he was a kid, he's always had glasses. And he said uh, he went to a new doctor later on in life and found out he had double vision. He had 20-20 vision, but it was double vision. He saw two of instead of one of. And then he compared that to his spiritual life. He, he celebrated his uh, spiritual birthday September 13th. Him and his wife, Teresa, got saved on that day. It was on a Wednesday night. And it's back in the back in the 70s. And I, I can't remember the exact date. Or was, I think it was 1977, as a matter of fact. Now to think about it. But he talked about how the you know his his vision, his worldly vision, was what it was. He said, and if you looked at how I was, if I give you my testimony of what I was like before, he said, I was anti-government, I was anti-law, I was anti-everything in during that time. But when God saved him, and he began to look at, through the lens of the Bible. God changed him completely, you know. And God, when He transforms, I mean, I thought about the same thing. I started wearing glasses at nine years old. I remember coming down to Dr. Orman's office there in Monroe, and I saw tree leaves, individual tree leaves for the first time. I thought, wow, look at that. That was something to see. And the same thing goes for our, my life in Christ. When the Lord saved me, He just changed the, how I looked at everything at that point. No more looking at pursuing the things of the flesh and the things that I wanted to go do. It was to look toward God and to look toward Him and, that, and rely on Him. Because I said, Lord, when I prayed that prayer, I said, Lord, I said, I've made a mess of everything. And I need you, I, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to do it anymore. I, I'm going to put my total trust in you. And I've told you all this before. He really impressed upon my heart that day. On my knees, just trust me. Just trust me. And not knowing which direction we're going next, that's what I've done. And God has, He's kept His word. He's kept His word. He is faithful all the way to the end. And for Him, there is no end. And for us, there is no end because when we come to the end of this life, we'll be with Him. And then that day when we all come, it'll all come back together. The bodies will come back and rejoin with the Spirit and we'll live forevermore with Him. There is no end, actually. Not with Christ, there's not. So I'm looking forward to that day. But what a blessing how God has transformed our lives and how He's blessed y'all. Appreciate y'all sharing all those things. If you will, turn with me to Matthew chapter, uh, I said chapter, chapter 4, excuse me, Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11. You can see the title up there. It says, What About the Devil? Hmm. What About the Devil? When you find your place, I want you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. Look at verse 1. And then uh, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, then he became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, or live on bread alone, excuse me, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on, your hand, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. 
Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall not worship the Lord your God. You shall, excuse me, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God, thank you for letting us be here today. We thank you for your mercy and grace and for everything that you've done for us. Lord, for your son who died on the cross for our sins, making it possible for us to be able to come to this throne of grace and just to worship you for who you are. Lord, I pray that you're glorified in everything that's said and done. I pray that you'd speak to every heart here today. <clears throat> and those that will see this video. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to their hearts as well. And we ask these things in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now, I've never been one... Uh, to be too big on surveys or polls when people take those things because I think they're all subjective. I mean, what, the person or the group, whoever's taking the poll, they can pretty much govern that thing to turn out the way they want it to turn out. And I'll give you an example. Uh, if you take, uh, if you want to take a survey on the Second Amendment and you want to have a strong anti-gun opinion on it, well, you take that survey in a very liberal community or a liberal state and you'll get that turnout the way you want it to be or vice versa, vice versa. However you want it to do, that's where you do. You control that. Well, during the pandemic, and notice I called it the pandemic, not the pandemic. I think this thing was, <laughs> I really think this thing was planned from way back. But during 2020, the Barna Group decided to do a survey on people who were searching for answers and turning to faith during this time and, and all, you know, how turmoil, what kind of turmoil that was. And so they've done a survey, and here's the information that they got from that, and it's pretty shocking about what, exactly what Americans believed. And they found that only 51%, just barely over half Americans, adult Americans, uh, have a traditional biblical view of God as the all-powerful and all-knowing Creator. Now, in 1991, about 29 years before that, there, that number was 73%. That's a decrease of 22%. It's pretty shocking, isn't it? There's another survey was taken, and I tried to find the year. I never could find the year for it. And it's hard to get those. It's hard to get an up-to-date survey. The only way you can get a 2022 survey is wait until next year. You know, so that sort of thing. But anyway, two thirds of this survey, two thirds of Americans do not believe in the devil as a living entity. In a nationwide survey, a phone survey, where they picked a thousand random people, and that's the way to do a survey if you're going to do one, called random people, okay? Just anywhere and everywhere. They were selected and asked if they agreed with this statement. And this is the statement they were given. Satan is not a living being, but is a symbol of evil. 62% of the people agreed with that statement. 62%. 32% disagreed, and it was 8% that didn't have an opinion at all. That's pretty bad. That, but that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me at all. People don't believe anything anymore. They really don't. Uh, Y'all see where this is going, right? More and more people. More and more people, they refuse to believe the Bible, and they refuse to believe what it has to say in regards to the existence of God and Satan. And they have chosen to embrace secular humanism. Now, if you don't know what that is, let me, let me give you the Webster d definition of that. It is a philosophy or belief system that embraces human reason, secular ethics, and philosophical naturalism while specifically rejecting religious dogma and supernaturalism as the basis of morality and decision making. In short, it means all religion is rejected and unwanted in governmental functions. I don't care if it's local, state, or federal. And in public education. If you're in the school system, you understand what I'm talking about. They don't want God there either. And simply put, there's no room for belief in God, Jesus, and again, the devil either. However, but what this amounts to is this. This is just another form of deception from Satan. That he has successfully, he has successfully blinded mankind to the point that less and less people are praying and depending on God to meet their needs. It doesn't matter to Satan if they, if people directly acknowledge, uh, you know, his existence or not. Just as long as they're not placing their trust in God, 
See, when you don't place your trust in God, you rob God of the worship that He deserves, which is what? That's Satan's main objective, right? To rob God of His, His glory. And He wants, and now don't be mistaken, He wants to worship, but it, which in an indirect sense, to not worship God, the God of heaven, is to worship Satan. So if you want to deny His existence, you just go right ahead. You're still worshiping Him whether you believe it or not. But there's another problem with denying Satan's existence. Theologian H.A. Ironside made this observation. He says, quote, There are those today who deny the personality of the devil. They say that all the devil there is is the evil of man's own heart, his own wicked desires, his own evil thoughts. And keep in mind, H.A. Ironside has been dead for a good while. Okay? The denial of the personality of the devil is, is a positive blasphemy against the Lord Jesus Christ. It means that he, talking about Jesus, was tempted by his own evil thoughts, by the wickedness of his own human heart. End quote. Now that's simply not possible. Because Jesus was and is the sinless Son of God. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus Christ was and is perfect. He is sinless. He is the monogenes. He is the one of a kind. He is the only, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He could never have been anything less than perfect or He would not have been the sufficient sacrifice for the sins of men. He couldn't have satisfied the law. The problem here is, is man's depravity. It's man's depravity and his cynicism where spiritual matters are concerned. He has made Satan out to be a cartoon character or a comic book character to be laughed at. Now everybody here has seen the movie Old Brother Art though, I'm sure, right? Well there's a scene in there where Everett, Pete, and Delmar pick up this guy named Tommy at this deserted crossroads. And Tommy gets in the car and asks him, hey, why are you out here? And he said, well, I come here to these crossroads last Saturday night to sell my soul to the devil so I can teach me how to play this guitar real good. Okay? So Everett, Everett says this, he makes a joke about it. He says, well, ain't it a small world, spiritually speaking? Pete and Delmar have just been recently been baptized and saved. I guess that leaves me the only one unaffiliated. <laughs> And, and, and so Tommy says, and, and Pete says to Tommy, he says, I've often wondered, what does the devil look like? And again, Everett, he picks, he's quick with the answer. He says, well, there are all manner of lesser imps and demons there, Pete, but the, the great Satan himself is red and scaly with a bifurcated tail and carries a hay fork. And everybody laughs. Everybody laughs. Everybody thinks it's funny. Because they associate that caricature of the devil, and therefore they don't take him serious. They just don't take him serious. But here's a whole a real cold hard fact. Satan is not a comic book character. He is a real created being. And in your spare time, and I'm sure most of y'all have read this, and if there's anybody seeing this video, if you've never read this, let me say this. Read Isaiah 14, 12 through 17, and Ezekiel 28, 12 through 19. God created Lucifer. He created him. He was perfect in all his ways until there was sin found in him. And this creates, of course, the question, if God created Lucifer, did he create him with the capacity to do evil? And God would never, and has never, ever created evil. But evil didn't just happen because that means if it did, if evil just happened, that means it infringed upon God's sovereign power. And that can't happen. That cannot happen. Now this is a brain burner right here. You're, you're not going to figure it out. You're not, you're not going to be able to reconcile any of this. But, because this is more than our finite minds can, can fathom, really. But here's the thing. This is the only answer I have for this argument. The secret things belong to God. The secret things belong to Him, and the things that He has revealed to us, He has, and the things that He hasn't, He's chosen not to, and He's not. And so, to, to try to understand that and try to reconcile all that would be a, a tough one. But this thing I do know, the evil that is present among us did not take God by surprise. It does not have the power to overcome a sovereign creator. It doesn't. R.C. Sproul made this statement. He said, think about Romans 8.28. He says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Unless God has sovereign power over evil, He will not be, he will not be able to keep that promise. 
And, but we know that God does have sovereign power over evil. We know that. He has sovereign power over all things. Amen? Amen. Amen. And He has the power to cause all things to work together for the good of those whom He loves. And He does so after the counsel of His will. God's in charge. Completely. So with all that said, the title of our message there, What About the Devil? What about him? Well, looking at our text, the first thing I want us to look at is his personage. That is his character. And I want you to take note. He is a deliberate enemy. Look at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, what he specializes in is tempting and deceiving men and women to pursue the things that gratify their flesh. He's good at that. Pursuing the flesh is rebe a rebellion against God because it robs God of our service that He's called us to do, and it robs God of the worship that He has created us to do. We were created to worship Him. Plain and simple. Nothing that Satan does, does he do randomly. Everything he does, he has an objective. And that objective is, is to destroy souls, lives, and testimonies, and to rob God of His glory. Now before I get ahead of myself, I want to point something out that may cause some concern, may cause some confusion. Verse 1 says, Jesus was led up by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When Jesus prayed the Lord's Prayer, here's what He said. He said, Lead us not into temptation. Is there a contradiction here? Not at all. The word tempt in the Greek word, uh, in the Greek is the word parazo, and it has two meanings. One, it means to prove or to try whether a thing can be done or to solicit evil. William MacDonald addresses this issue. Here's what he says. Why would the Holy Spirit lead him to such an encounter? This temptation was necessary to demonstrate his moral fitness to do the work for which he had come into the world. The first Adam proved his unfitness for dominion when he when he met the adversary in the Garden of Eden. Here the last Adam meets the devil in a head-on confrontation and emerges unscathed." End quote. Now there are a lot of people that need to read this and let this sink in. Uh, when trials and suffering come to our door, quite naturally, what's the first thing we do? We pray and ask the Lord for deliverance. We think the devil's trying to get on us. Or, but you know what? It may be that God is bringing you to, into this wilderness to be tempted by Satan, not to sin, but to test you and to prove you and whether, you're, uh, whether or not it's your, this thing that you're doing can be done. That is to prepare you for that next task, to get you ready for the next step, test. And if God purposely brings us to it, guess what? He's more than capable to, to bring us through it. And He will. Absolutely. And the time of testing or possible chastisement could be chastisement reasons. You could be have done something that the Lord has got to chastise you. Remember, read, read 2 Corinthians 5. Read 2 Corinthians 5 sometime. But... If it's t t whatever it may be, three things are going to get proven here. Number one, it's going to prove God's faithfulness. It's going to strengthen our faith, and God's going to be glorified. Satan, on, his only purpose is the total opposite. These trials are used to cause us to doubt God's faithfulness, to weaken our faith in order to ruin our testimony, or to rob God of His glory. This is why Satan desired to tempt Jesus. Now, I know y'all know what I'm going to say here, but there might be somebody on this video that doesn't know this. So I'm going to say it for that reason only. Satan is not omniscient. He is not omniscient. He can't read minds. He can't see into the future. He only knows what God has allowed him to know. And what Satan knew about the Messiah is that God had already revealed in His Word, that is in the Old Testament, who his son was going to be, or about the anointed one. Satan knew that the Lord's anointed would be the son of David, and he read that in 2 Samuel 7. So at this point, or what point did Satan set his sights on Jesus? Now I'm speculating here, but if I had to guess, the moment Mary's Immaculate Conception was announced probably caught his attention. He knew what Isaiah 7, 14 says, you know, a, a child will be born to a virgin. He's read that. He knew that. So when that took place, that probably caught his attention. And then there was the angels telling the shepherds to go see a child that was born in the stable, that he is the Savior who is the Christ. That probably caught his attention too. And I couldn't find any Old Testament references to this event. But just think about it. When you have a multitude of heavenly hosts singing praises to the Lord and saying glory to God in the highest and the peace among men and whom, whom He is well pleased, that's, that's kind of hard to hide. 
Satan saw it. And so my thought is, he, he was ready for that. When, when he saw that, oh, there's something happening here. We know what's taking place. And then along with that, some two years later, kings from the east, the Magi, they came inquiring in Matthew 2.2, 2, where is he who was born the king of the Jews? Satan heard it. He heard that. And so what does he do? He imposes upon Herod's suspicious and insecure and sinful heart to kill Jesus while he is still a toddler, but God protected him. God protected the baby Jesus. And from that point on, all Satan was allowed to do was to keep an eye on Mary's little boy. That's all he was able to do. And then finally came the day, in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says this, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him, and behold, a voice of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This proclamation from the Father coupled with the, combines with the language in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, which says, I will surely tell you or tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And also Isaiah 42, 1, which says this, behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. For anyone that was listening that had messianic expectations, this, these verses would have resonated in their soul. And you better believe that Satan was listening. And he knew every one of those passages, what he knew every one of them, what they said, and what they meant, and who they pointed to. And so after Jesus has gotten the Father's approval, he's led up into the wilderness, led up into the wilderness by the Spirit, where God is going to allow his son to be tempted by the devil. So ever since the fall, think about this. Ever since the fall of man, you know, Satan went in, he tempted, he beguiled Eve, and then he she brings the fruit to Adam, and you know the story. Adam seen with his eyes wide open. Adam made, he just he he failed. He failed bad. And ever since then, Satan has had no respect for mankind, none whatsoever. I mean, you can hear him right now saying, you know, so this is the Lord's anointed. This is the son of David. He's flesh, just like everybody else. And flesh is easy to manipulate. Guess what? I'm going to make short work of this dude. I'm going to I'm going to do, tempt him the same way that I tempted Adam and Eve. I'm going to tempt him with the the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I'm going to do the same thing to them to him as I did to them. And guess what? He's going to fall, just like they did. Some crown jewels they turned out to be. This man's not going to be any different. This is what I'm going to do. And this is why the Holy Spirit proved or tested Jesus, not to see if there was any sin in him, because that had already been, that had already been, uh, he already gained the Father's approval when he came up out of the Jordan River. It wasn't for that. It was to prove to the devil and to mankind that, for, <laughs> that flesh would follow his commands. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Now look at verse 2. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. So now he knows who Jesus is, or he assumes he knows who Jesus is, and he's waiting until Jesus is at his weakest point before he moves into position. Do you understand, does that sound odd to you that God would be at his weakest? The creator of this universe would be at his weakest, but you've got to remember, this is God veiled in human flesh. He's willfully emptied himself. That Greek word for, for emptied himself is literally means he laid aside his divine privileges. So from a human standpoint, Jesus is feeling the physical demands of not eating and drinking for the last 40 days and 40 nights. But at the same time, he is still God who changes not. He is still God who holds everything right here in the palm of his hand. This is more than we can humanly fathom. But Satan's not trying to fathom anything. Now he knows who Jesus is. He's waiting until Jesus is at his weakest, and then he's going to make his move. Theologian Graham Scroggie said this. He said, The tempter is a master in his choice of hours, and although he, he may come at any time, there are certain times when almost certainly he will come. And here he gives this example. He said, In and after seasons of special blessings, we should especially be watchful and on the eve of every holy enterprise. That's right. Jesus had just been baptized. Jesus had just been officially inaugurated and proclaimed by the Father. He's fixing to embark on a three-year ministry that's going to turn the world upside down. 
It's going to change the lives of 12 men. And those 12, well, one was one he had another purpose for. But he's going to change the lives of these men and they're going to share the gospel and they're going to share, change the lives of other people. So Jesus is fixing to embark on something great right here. But Satan, he knows he's got to act when the moment presents itself. He's bold and he's deliberate, but he's patient. He's not going to attack until we're at our weakest point. He's not going to attack us on our strongest point spiritually. He's going to wait till we're weak. And that's why he is patiently waiting for the sign of weakness. And then he makes his move. And now that Jesus is hungry, Satan is going to appeal to the Lord's flesh, just like he did, just like he did Eve in the garden. When he came to Eve in Genesis 3, 6, it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food... She saw that it was good for food. He appealed to her flesh, and he made her take her focus off of what was right and put it on herself. And this is what he's going to attempt to do to Jesus. He's going to make him focus or try to get him to focus on himself rather than the will of the Father. Warren Wearsby said it is important to note that Jesus faced the enemy as a man and not as God. He didn't rely on his divine power because if he had, he would have, he would have done exactly what the devil wanted him to do. Look at verse 3. He says, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Well, of course he could turn them into bread. If Jesus does this, though, he shatters the absolute trust and submission uh, uh, to the Father. MacArthur said to have succeeded would have been would have put an irreparable rift in the Trinity. They would no longer have been three in one, no longer have been one mind and one purpose. In his incalculable pride and wickedness, Satan tried to fracture the very nature of God himself. And Satan wasn't ready for the Lord's response. Look at verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The old boy probably did a double take. He wasn't expecting that. He, he looked back at how it's always been for the last thousands and thousands of years, beginning even with, with Adam and Eve. Apparently the word doesn't say it, but Adam didn't put up a struggle. Whenever Eve handed him that fruit, whatever that was, he didn't put up a struggle. And the belief is that when that was happening to Eve, Adam was standing there watching. Because Adam wanted to know too. And when he let Eve go ahead and do it, he went ahead and took it. And this is what he's trying to do here. He, he's not expecting Jesus to say what he's going to say. And Jesus, what Jesus said is, is actually from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Eve did. Eve quoted scripture too when it happened, and, but she added something to it. Genesis 3 3 says, God has said, You shall not eat from it. Here's the part he added in. Or touch it. God didn't say that. Or you will die. Now, Satan's probably standing there and he's probably grinning, thinking, So this man wants to quote scripture. Okay, well, let's just see what he knows. If, if he lives only by the word of God, then I'll just quote the word of God to him. So Satan tries another approach. Look at his plan. And I want you to take note when you look at the plan, he is a deceptive enemy. And he's going to use all his deceptive powers. Watch what he does in, Luke, in verses 5 and 6. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, first of all, this pinnacle that he's talking about may have been on the roof that overextended uh, Herod's portico, <coughs> according to Jewish historian Josephus. This is the, this is the same pinnacle that J uh, James, the half-brother of the Lord, was martyred from. They threw him off of there. But take note of Satan's deception here. He's quoting Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12. And he does so to make the temptation just a little bit more persuasive. Oh, we have something akin here. We have something in common. And you, you want to quote God's word? Okay, I'll quote God's word with you. And so he does. And the devil seemed to be saying, if you live by and trust God's word, then trust God to keep his word where your physical safety is concerned. He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. He's clever, the devil is. He really is. He says, let your father act if you want. Let's see if he is all he, you say he is. This kind of temptation went on throughout the Lord's ministry. The whole three years that he's preaching and, and, and teaching and, and going throughout Israel, 
this went on. Everybody approached him and said, give us a sign. Give us a sign and we'll believe. No, they wouldn't. Everywhere he went, he healed somebody. He healed, he made the blind to see. He cleansed the lepers. It was a man's hand was withered and he restored the hand to, to, to brand new. On the Sabbath, and it made them old boys mad, but he restored that hand. He even raised a man from the dead right before their eyes. And what did they do? They called him eating, discussed how they were going to kill him. They didn't believe him. They wanted him dead. Quoting Abraham, this is what the Lord said in Luke 16, 31. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. And that's the truth. And that's the truth. And this testing went on all the way while he's hanging on the cross. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 41 and 42, In the same way the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. No, they wouldn't. And they try to figure out another way to get him back on the cross. Here's the point. God has nothing else to prove to anybody. He has nothing else to prove to anybody that He exists. All the evidence is right here before us right now. Look at verse 7. Jesus said to them, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Here Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 6, 16. Now, the Lord is the master swordsman when it comes to... It's His Word. He, he wrote the book. He knows the book. And Satan thought he could. He had Jesus backed into a corner, but Jesus came out swinging with Scripture. And there are two reasons here why Jesus refused to be a part of this foolish display. One is sensationalism, pure and simple. Sensationalism. Sensationalism appeals to the flesh. Here's an example. You have a motorcycle, guy on a motorcycle, and he jumps 300 feet. It's one and done, right? The only way to make it better is what? Add 10 feet to it. Remember, y'all remember Evil Knievel? I know most everybody in here remembers Evil Knievel. I don't know how many buses he would jump, but he would always add one more. <coughs> one more. That's the only way you're going to make it any better. Sensationalism never stops. Jesus had performed so many miracles, and yet they're still calling for signs. He had given them what they'd asked for. His father, you know, he, he, he had done that. He had done those signs. But if he had kept on doing that, they would have become lovers of sensation and not lovers of God, which is what Satan's plan is right here. If it had been possible to get Jesus to take the bait, his perfect holiness and his divinity would have been shattered along with man's hope of salvation. He would have placed his will and judgment over the fathers, which is exactly what Adam did, which is exactly why Christ came to prove obedience could be done. Here's what Jesus said in John 5, verse 30. He says, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. Now we've seen the person and the plan. Let's look at His persistence. And I want you to take note. He is a determined enemy. This old boy is not going to let up. Again, look at verse 8. He says, Again, the, the devil took him on a, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Now, <coughs> Satan knows what appeals to the flesh, right? He knows exactly what appeals to the flesh. Jack Andrews wrote this. He said, He tries all avenues available to him. He appeals to our appetites, our ambitions, and our adoration. He will offer us anything to get what he wants. And he's tried to get Jesus to do for himself, and he's failed. He's tried to get Jesus to test the Father's promises on his behalf, and he's failed. This time, Satan makes one final attempt to make Jesus sin. He reveals to the Lord his supreme purpose, and that is to what? To obtain his worship. Look at verse 9. He says to him, All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. That's the one major thing that Satan wanted. He wants our worship. What amazes me the most is in his attempt to gain the Lord's worship, he tempts Jesus with what was already his. Now I know since the fall, Satan holds the deed to earth, but only because God is permitting him to, and he knows that. And that probably makes him hate God even more because he knows, how, no matter how hard he tries, he knows he'll never be able to own, to own earth outright. 
So it is right here in this moment with Jesus that he's got to win. He must win this moment right here. Whether he knows it or not, this is his best shot to take full ownership. And Jesus has not folded yet. So I don't know if he's frustrated or if he's in desperation mode. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But he knows he's got to get Jesus to worship him. Wiersbe said Satan has always wanted worship because Satan has always wanted to be God. And worshiping the creature instead of the creator is the lie that rules our world today. And that's the truth. Man will worship nature. He will worship the stars. He will worship the devil. He will even worship himself. But he will not worship the God who created him. Billions of people today worldwide worship the pleasures and the possessions, everything that the world has to offer, but the one who made the world. In 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul said this. I remember Chuck McKnight preaching a message on this one verse. It says, For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. I want you to listen to what Herbert Locker said about this event. He said, Before he met Paul, we can picture him as an agreeable young man with no particular vice. Under the strong influence of Paul's personality, Demas was like a piece of soft iron, temporarily magnetized by the, the presence of the magnet. Becoming a disciple, he was carried away by the enthusiasm of the sacrifice. He wanted to live and die with Paul. But when Demas came up to the great capital of the then known world in company of the Lord's prisoners, it was a different story. He was not a prisoner and gradually the contrast between the cell and the outer world became intolerable to him. So he saw the magnificent halls of the Caesars, the gorgeous homes of the rich, venal or corrupt loves, jest and wine. Such a carefree world cast a glamour over Demas and he yielded to its charms. We have people every day professors of Christianity that once they get out and get, get their eyes turned to the things of the world they chase after the things of the world the, the pleasures and the possessions and that's what Satan does sadly and he has been successful in gathering as many victims as he can in that trap and unbeknownst to them here's what happens when they do that they are worshiping the one who offers up the passing pleasures of the world without directly saying I worship Satan they are and what Satan offered Jesus was uh, what he did to Jesus he offered it on corrupt terms not God's terms and what God has promised the Lord he promised it to him on right, for his righteous obedience Satan offers Jesus this for his unrighteous disobedience and that's his goal is to make us disobey to make us turn and not worship the one who created us the one who can give us life everlasting well, we've seen his person, his plan, and his persistence. Now let's look at the last point, his powerlessness. Take a note that he is a defeated enemy. Look at verses 10 and 11. Jesus again goes to the Word of God. This time he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 13 and chapter 10, verse 20. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Jesus defeated Satan by using the Word of God. He didn't try to bind him up. He just quoted God's truth and obeyed it fully. He sought the will of the Father and not his own. Remember, he's fighting this battle as a man, not God incarnate. But now watch this. MacArthur said, The devil had stepped beyond all bounds in proposing such an unutterable wickedness because Satan's power is only by God's permission. When the Son commanded him to leave, he had no choice but to obey. Therein Christ demonstrated the very sovereign power Satan wanted him to misuse. Amen. That's right. Flesh or divine, Jesus is still God. William McDonald also said something pretty interesting. He said, from the temptation of Jesus, we learned that the devil can attack those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, but that he is powerless against those who resist him with the Word of God. That's right. That's the key right there, folks. That's the key. Don't be foolish as to think that you can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil and win, because here's what happened. We can't do it. We can't do it. James 4, 7 says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The first mistake that some people make is this. They try to resist the devil on their own without submitting to God first and guess what? He ends up eating their lunch. He eats them up. And then James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The second mistake they make is that they may have submitted to God and they may have resisted the devil but instead of drawing near to the master here they stand like something crazy watching the devil flee and while they're standing there with their chest stuck out, the devil regroups and he comes back for more. He may be a defeated enemy, but he is not going to stop. He's just going to keep coming back. 
And so after our, after our verse 7 victory, we must always fall back on verse 8. Draw near to God, and He, and he will draw near to us. Psalm 18, 2 says, The Lord is, a, is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And uh, there's an old hymn that was that was written back in 1940 by a man named J.B. Coates. Most of y'all remember this. It's entitled, Where Could I Go? Where Could I Go? I don't think it's in our hymn book now. I, th I know it's in the old hymn books that I grew up with. But I, remember, I don't know if it's in there or not. They might be under a different title. You know how they retitle things. But here's the chorus to, this, to that song. He says, Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? That's right. Friend, there is no better or closer friend than Jesus Christ. In your worst day, there's nobody better than Jesus Christ. When you feel like you can't go on anymore, all you got to do is cry out. And He hears you. He's not going to leave you. He promised. He can't break a promise. God can't break a promise. I don't care how lonely you feel. God, even in your loneliest moment, He's that, that's how, He's that much closer. He's right there. He's, he's right there with you. Thank God for that. But the thing about it is there are people that are going to hell every day because they choose not to put their trust in the Master. And I don't care how much you persuade them. I don't care how much, what tragedies happen in your life. I've come to realize this. People say, well, I hope that turns them around. Listen here, unless the Holy Spirit's involved in that, they're not going to turn from that. Tragedy did not turn people. It's the Holy Spirit that turns people. He has to come in and draw them people to himself. Yes, he'll take those situations and he'll, he'll work them. But that person has got to submit to the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. They've got to surrender to that quickening. When, they, when that dead spirit is made alive and they see their sins for what they are, they've got to surrender to that. You've got to say, yes, Lord, I am a sinner. I need you in my life. And so many people choose not to. That's sad. That's sad. The best friend they could ever have is just a prayer away. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God, thank you for your mercy and grace and for allowing us to be here today. I thank you, Father, for, for taking care of me and, and, Lord, for what you've done for me. Lord, you are the, the best friend that we could have. You are our Lord, our Master. You are our love. God, you are everything you are to us. And we thank you for who you are. Lord, I pray that this message is spoken to someone's heart here today. Lord, you know who, who needed to hear it. And Lord, for those who see the video, God, I pray that you would impact their life as well. God, go with us and that whatever we do in word or deed may be done for your glory. And we ask these things in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen.